book I can take carry like this. I think Rachi will start. Uh, he join in a while. Okay. Uh, a very good evening to all of you. Uh, today, uh, this is from Echo. A very good evening to all of you. Uh, today's memorial service is being held by Surabji family to pay homage to Shri Soli Surabji, who passed away on 30th of uh, April in the morning. Mr. Surabji was not only a champion of human rights, but a great human who touched a lot of lives. He was also known for his taste for good music and good food. On this note, I will request uh, Honorable Mr. Justice Henry Ravanna, the Chief Justice, to say a few words. Over to you. Yes, yes, yes. Dear brother and sister judges, my friends from the bar, respected members of the audience and members of Soli's family, it is difficult to accept that it has already been a month since we have lost one of the greatest legal minds an advocate for the rule of law and a champion of constitutional rights. It would be a herculean task to describe in few words the achievements of an eminent jurist for his long and illustrious career. Soli Torabji started his practice before the Bombay High Court in 1953 when the freedom movement was still fresh in the nation's mind. No doubt, the freedom movement and the vision of the far framers of the constitution influenced him greatly. He was a man with an unflinching faith in the constitutional ideals, particularly those relating to the freedom of speech and human rights. He was a defender of civil liberties during the tough emergency era. He played a crucial role in some of the most iconic cases which have defined the legal landscape of this great nation. He assisted Mr. Nani Palkiwala in the Golaknath and Kesavananda Bharati cases as a counsel and subsequently the Attorney General of India. He argued many landmark cases such as America Gandhi, DC Vadwa, and SR Bomai. It can be stated in unequivocal terms that he played a pivotal role in crafting our country's jurisprudence. He brought honor and glory not only to himself, but to the institution as a whole. In the early years of my career, I had the opportunity to personally witness Soli's brilliance. I remember it is in 1988, first I met Soli to brief him on a matter relating to the then chief minister of my state. Even before I started briefing him, I realized that he had already read the entire file and had the details of the case at his fingertips, which reflected his dedication to the brief. The briefing lasted uh, just four or five minutes in which Soli asked me only two questions. To my surprise, at the hearing next day, those were the very same questions posed by the bench to Soli. I thought I had seen a profit in action. I must admit that he was one of those who inspired me to continue in the profession. Apart from his uh, courtroom genius, Soli was an epitome of grace, modesty, 
humility, integrity, and kindness, which always stood out to me. He lived his life holy on his terms and pursued his diverse passions with great energy. He left an indelible mark on many. Soli's untimely death due to COVID was a, a complete shock, though he was passed into the realm of the immortal, but his memory will endure. We have lost a great soul, but we shall continue to remember the great human qualities he possessed, which can help us through these difficult times. His spirit and confidence in the constitutional ethos of this country and his never ending quest for justice should be our guide. A true tribute to Soli would be to continue to uphold the constitutional values, the fundamental rights and freedom that are essential for human existence in a civilized society. People like Soli continue to live in our memories. I would like to thank his family for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts on this Solomon occasion. I pray to the Almighty to give all of you comfort and peace. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Chief, for such kind words. Uh, now I'll request Honorable Justice Yuyu Lalit to say a few words. Yes. The Honorable the Chief Justice, all the esteemed speakers, Mrs. Zena Sorabji and the entire Sorabji family, ladies and gentlemen. I consider myself extremely privileged that I could be part of the chambers of a legendary council, Soli J. Sorabji. I did little over five years in his chamber. During this time, when he fought many legal battles in court as juniors, we could watch how a brilliant mind could tackle many a problem which may have otherwise overwhelmed lesser mortals. Legal issues covering various subjects, normal civil or commercial litigations and constitutional matters were a regular feature. Those years in his chambers not only gave us tremendous experience and insights in various subjects, but the best was we could see a top class mind and illustrious counsel deal with those legal issues with greatest of ease. And what was important was the council was one who was firmly rooted in constitutional values, having great respect for true traditions at the bar. All in all, it was a great package which got unfolded every time for us to see and experience for ourselves. Truly, as his juniors, we had everything that a young lawyer could ask for. All his juniors shall eternally be grateful to Mr. Sorabji for giving such enriching experience. But first thing first, way back when I had not even joined law college, I had watched an interview of Mr. Sorabji on Doordarshan. He was additional solicitor general then. That's when I heard the name Sorabji first. Then I found in my father's library a book named Law on Press Censorship by Mr. Sorabji, which I read with great interest. And I became a fan of a person called Sorabji. I did my first case as a lawyer in Mumbai with Arshad Hidayatullah and in that connection went to see him on few occasions. He used to sit in a chamber in the annexe of the Bombay High Court. Outside the chamber was a board with the name of Mr. Sorabji at the top with other illustrious names. My first matter in Delhi after I shifted to the Supreme Court took me to the chambers of Mr. Sorabji who was the lead counsel in the matter. The fan and the young lawyer in me was all ready and the destiny also played its part. In few months thereafter, I was a junior and thus began my association with this chamber 
which taught me everything. Mr. Swarab ji excelled in all branches of law, you name it, and he left his mark and dealt with the leading cases in that branch. One case which needs specific mention was review petition in Union Carbide case, where he had put in a lot of efforts. But according to me, one area which was very dear to him was freedom of expression, free press, and yes, Article 19.1a of the Constitution. That was one fortress which he always zealously guarded and would put in all his energies in keeping all obstructions at bay. He was the best guardian of that fortress. While I was in his chambers, he had appeared in S. Rangarajan, which was decided by Justice K. Jagannath Shetty, and the matter concerning serial name Thomas, which was decided by Justice Sabesachi Mukherjee. We could see great commitment to the cause, which brought in his scholarship and industry. These cases made a lasting impression on us as juniors. The issues concerning right under Article 191A were extremely dear to Mr. Swarabji. Large number of his articles and write-ups touched upon this subject. Even in cases where he had not appeared as a counsel, the student of law and the vigilant citizen in him would rise on every occasion and express himself through brilliant pieces of eloquence. His love and passion for this branch of law was ongoing and ever evolving. I recollect in a matter concerning movie Arakshan, two of his former juniors were appearing against each other and battling it out in a court presided over by Justice M.K. Sharma. All through the matter, Mr. Swarabji was there in court and watching the proceedings with great interest. And sure enough, in few days time, an article written by him appeared in the press. We are all aware of the enormous achievements of Mr. Swarabji and towering heights that he reached in the legal profession. He was not only a versatile counsel, but was also a great music enthusiast, loved English poetry, horse racing, and was a champion of rights of minority and a human rights activist. Truly a multifaceted person who was full of love for life. We all are saddened by the demise of Mr. Swarabji. I recollect a small piece by him in the memory of late Justice Bhagwati, and the last lines were, I may quote, if there be another planet that we inhabit after we have shuffled off a mortal coil, I would like to be with dear Praful and reminisce and recount a judicial journey in this planet. Borrowing the same thought, I may say that if there be such planet and when my time comes, I would like to be around as his junior on that planet. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Chip, for such kind words. Now I'll request Honorable Mr. Justice D.Y. Chandrachu to say a few words, please. Uh, Lord Chip, you, are, you have to unmute yourself. Yes. Yeah. Honorable Chief Justice of India, my very distinguished colleague, Justice Uday Larith, uh, members of the family of uh, Mr. Swari Swarabji, Zina Anti, uh, Zia Jahangir, Hormaz, uh, distinguished members of the bar and all the uh, panelists today and invitees. In November 1962, a German national by the name of Meyer Hans George boarded a Swiss air flight from Zurich destined for Manila. When he landed in Mumbai and was accosted by the DRI officials, he was found to have 24 hidden recesses in a jacket and was carrying 34 kilograms of gold. There was a notification of the Reserve Bank of 1948 that if you were in transit and in possession of gold, that was not an offense. But that notification had been withdrawn in 1962. Meyer Hans George was convicted and sentenced and he appealed to the High Court. The appeal before the High Court was led by a 33-year-old Soli Sorabji, together with Mr. Avinash Rana. The bench of the Bombay High Court was presided over by Justice Y.V. Chandrachud, and they set aside the conviction. Mr. Sorabji argued that neither he nor Avinash Rana had been able to locate 
the notification of the Reserve Bank of India in the library of the Bombay High Court. So least of all, could you say that a Swiss national who was a German uh, would have any mens rea to violate Indian law? The judgment of the Bombay High Court was reversed in appeal by the Supreme Court by a bench of Justice Rajgopal Iyengar and Justice Mudholkar with a tremendously eloquent dissent by Justice Subara. But what was very significant was that in 1967, Soli Sorabji argued Satwan Singh Sahani before a bench presided over by Chief Justice Subarao, where the Supreme Court held that the right to travel abroad was part of the fundamental freedoms and later was, of course, reiterated in Manika Gandhi. Mr. Sorabji's career spanned Satwan Singh, Keshwanand Bharti, Maneka, Sunil Batra, DC Vadwa, Bommai, and Coelho, only to mention a few cases. For a lawyer who had his moorings in excise law, this was a remarkable evolution of Soli as a constitutional lawyer. His represented the voice of moral authority, of a defender of personal liberty, of human liberty, both within and outside the court, of a fearless crusader for human freedom, and his columns in various newspapers bear a testimony to this crusade. Through the cycles of life, which we have all seen, he yet maintained a close connect to its graces, to the elemental graces of life, whether it was poetry or jazz. Humor never deserted him. He was an abundant mimic, and his mimicry of Justice Tulzaburkar, among other things, I believe Justice Vaibhi Chandrachud also, would rank as one of the all-time greats in the theatrical tradition. One measure of a life which is truly lived, well-lived, is the ability to inspire and mentor a band of professionals who will carry forth the legacy and even better, the master. For as we say in Sanskrit, Shishyat Ichet Parayajayam, the ultimate belief of the Guru who leads you from intellectual darkness into light is that those who follow in the footprints of his, of the sands of time will better or excel him in his art. I think the galaxy of distinguished members of the bar today who are present today with us is a testimony to Soli's ability to mentor and allow others to excel. My distinguished colleague, Justice Uday Lalit, is truly a tribute to that ability of Mr. Sorabji to create and mentor professionals who will carry forth his legacy. One was always in awe to enter his chambers. His junior sat on his left. Questions were always terse. He made distinctive notes at the back of the brief in his very beautiful handwriting. If you had a cold, you ran the risk of being thrown out of the chamber. And it's so ironical that it was the virus which got him in the end. The fate of a high value multi crore starer would be sealed in a few minutes of conference. There was always a brief turn of phrase when Mr. Sorabji instructed a junior on what you had to do. So one day in the Supreme Court corridor, he walked up to me and said, you have to research on the ordinance Raj. We are going to appear before the constitution bench. Now, I didn't know what the ordinance Raj was from Adams. But this was a book by Dr. D.C. Wadhwa, who was a professor at the Gokhale Institute of Economics and Politics, who while researching into land tenures in Bihar, found that there was a consistent pattern of the repromulgation of ordinances. And the book came to be known as Repromulgation of Ordinances, a Fraud in the Constitution of India. Soli led the arguments. And for me, what was really fascinating was the day when, or several days when he called me up and told me to be at his chambers at Sundarnagar at six o'clock in the morning, when we discussed just the two of us, the finer nuances of the case. His formulation was down to one page. Such was the clarity of mind. For me, he has been a mentor truly. I can never forget the call in the middle of 1998 when he called me to ask me whether I would be willing to accept the position of additional Solicitor General of India, which of course I accepted with a great amount of gratitude. When I was asked to be a judge in 1998, I turned to Soli for advice on a luncheon meeting at the home of Changu uh, Gagrat, the very 
the doyen of the bar. And Soli was trying to tell me that, well, you know, the die is cast. I think you have to answer the call of service. And Zia, in that inimitable style, turned to me and said, please ask Papa why he did not accept the advice which he is asking you to follow today. Well, I accepted the advice of my mentor. And I've never regretted it, even for a day. Let me give you one small incident and then possibly conclude, and which has been known to my family and to our close circle as the Dhakta incident. For the non-Marathi speaking audience, I must tell you that Dhakta in Marathi means the younger one. It would really refer to a younger sibling, a Dhakta, a Dhakti Bahin, a younger sister or a Dhakta brother. So Mr. Surabji had come to the residence of Dr. Vyas Chitale one evening, and he was offered the customary drink, which he of course said yes to. He had his drink, and when Sridhar asked him after he had completed his drink as to whether he would have a second, he turned to both of us in Marathi and said, he said, Baba, mala dhakta de. Give me a dhakta or a small one. So this incident where Soli used his knowledge of Marathi interspersed for a, an evening conversation has always become legendary in the family. They are wonderful memories of a life truly well lived. But I think what marks out Soli's career is the transformation from being a top quality professional from the assembly line of brilliance of the Bombay Bar to a citizen of the nation which Delhi brought about in him. When he moved to Delhi, he ceased to be just an eminent lawyer and he became a true citizen of the nation. And I believe his stewardship of the India International Center was in so many ways a symbol an emblem of his being represented of the true traditions and values of the Indian bar and bound by constitutional faith and ideology. So as I said, these are wonderful memories of a life well lived. For Zina Auntie, I must say this, that you represent the grace and the strength of the Sorabji family. Jahangir, I know personally the numerous trips to Delhi to attend to the needs of a parent who was desperately in need of medical attention at the time. I bow down to you. Ormaz, you have led the same family tradition. Zia, you have spurred the family tradition of excellence to absolutely new heights, and you have been a mentor to men and women across the nation in your quest of excellence. But let me conclude by saying that Mr. Sorabji's life was full of wit, full of energy, full of humor, but above all, committed to the rule of and by a just law. I'm very thankful to you, uh, the family of Mr. Surabji, for giving me this opportunity and joining my colleague and all of you this evening in paying my humble tribute and homage to a great soul. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lord Chip, for such kind words. Uh, now I'll request Mr. Salve to speak a few words, please. Honorable Chief Justice, Justice Lalit, Justice Chandrachur, other judges, Z Zena, Zia, Jangir, Hormas, other members of the family, and other colleagues and other friends who are today <clears throat> participating in this meeting. It's very difficult for me to speak about Soli. Soli the man, Soli the lawyer, Soli the jazz aficionado, Soli the literature buff, so many parts to his personality. But most of all, Soli the dear friend. One remarkable thing about Soli, which I realized, was despite our difference in age, he worked very hard to convert me from a junior to a friend. And it, it was almost comical once when he said, uh, I called him sir, and he says, call me Soli. I said, yes, sir. He says, again, you're calling me sir. I said, yes, sir, I'll call you Soli, sir. 
He said, will you drop the surf for God's sake? The surf fell off when we started frequenting jazz clubs together. But I spent, I think I had the privilege of spending more time with him than with my family and my wife between 1980 and 1986. We used to start work early in the morning. We used to finish in the evening. We used to wait anxiously for Rudy Cotton to arrive so that we got free to go home. Because it could be the biggest case, it could be the richest client, it could be an industrialist, it could be a member of the government. When Rudy arrived, conferences ended. And on that hangs a tale, that, that, that was the man. His value system was such that sitting with Rudy Cotton, an old musician friend, before Rudy went off to Taj, was more important than being with some billionaire businessman who had come with his problems. We have all, members of the bar, we have all seen Soli weave his magic over and over again. But some of the conversations about law explain what the man was about. As I always felt, Soli had a rare combination of having the mind of a jurist and the heart of an advocate. And that is why he was so eloquent, so persuasive, but so sound in his legal principles. And for him, law became a way of life. I remember once he was having an argument with Zia and he put his hand on the phone and said, damn natural justice. I have to hear her even if I know she's wrong, <laughs> but I have to give her a hearing. <laughs> and I realized it had become such a part of his marrow. Fairness, natural justice, all this had become a part of his system. He used to talk to us at length about how he enjoyed developing the law back, back in the day in Mumbai. He spoke of, particularly spoke of Justice Tarkunde and how they developed the principle of arbitrariness. That if a, if a classification was too wide or if a law was too wide, it would, be, it would violate 14. And what about where there is no law? Why should that not why, why, if for sure I violate 14? And that's how the absence of law arbitrariness principle evolved. But he also used to tell us stories of how they used to, the pranks they used to pull on colleagues. They, on more than one occasion on a weekend, they would conduct a mock court. And one of them, one of their favorite victims was, I think, Raman Bhai Joshi, <laughs> whom they used to corner and made him feel that there was actually a court running and there was no court. <laughs> so he brought all these things together so beautifully. And that helped his advocacy because I realized the way he would read a court, the way he would read a bench, stemmed from his basic ability to connect with human beings. It was a human value. That's why I say he had the heart of an advocate. This human value he used with such great advantage in a court hearing, he would immediately know. And uh, Justice Chandrachud spoke of his attempt at speaking Marathi. He would invariably try to talk to me in Marathi. And in the middle of an argument, he would turn around and say something to me in Marathi. One advantage was Nobody else in Delhi at that time really spoke Marathi. So that, that was our private language of communication, especially if you had to say something unpleasant about a judge or about a colleague. And that is the other characteristic of Soli is he liked to share. He liked to share his music. He liked to share his life. He liked to share his law. And that is why he has created what I call the Sarabji tribe of lawyers. Justice Lalit is a part of our tribe. I can see Ganesh here, Gopal here. We are all proud to be of the Sorabji tribe. And each of us learned not just law from him. We learned how to think, 
we learned how to think on first principles. He'd get very irritated if you start shoving judgments under his nose. He used to say, first, let's talk about it on first principles. He taught us how to think. He taught us how to read a matter. He taught us how, and once it was very interesting, Justice Chandrachud, when he was Chief Justice, made certain comments. And we came back and he says, see, this is, Harish, what you have to learn. When you're arguing in the Supreme Court, it's not logic. You have to also understand the judges are not going to buy any spiel you give them. They have a broader vision. And that's the difference between a high court and a Supreme Court. He says, always remember that. His passion for freedom of speech was such that I don't know how many people have had this privilege. I have appeared with Soli in, part, in uh, Tisadari once, where an injunction had been sought against India today, publishing an interview. And I think it was uh, Mr. Satish Sharma or somebody, some politician who had gotten an injunction. And we were applying for vacating the injunction. And Soli and I used to troop down to uh, Tisadari to argue before the district judge. And of course, what Soli would love is on the way back, stop at some hole in the wall restaurant. He could, and he knew he'd be sick in the evening, but he could not resist eating food from these small restaurants. The, the, com the common man in him, the simplicity in him was always remarkable. He, he wore his laurels so lightly on his shoulders. And that is something we all learned from him. But if you really wanted to see Soli in his element, you have to see Soli in a jazz club. Gone was the strict lawyer. We know as juniors, he used to keep us on a very tight leash. You walk into a jazz club and it was a different human being, complete metamorphosis in the person. We've had some lovely moments, part of the Delhi Jazz Society, organizing our jazz yatras. We've, uh, Soli and I had the privilege of traveling together. We, in fact, did an arbitration in 1986 in Paris. And every evening we used to go up to a jazz club in Paris. Whenever in summer he was in London, I used to be in London. We used to go to Ronnie Scott's. And he knew so many musicians. It was lovely. He would go and chat with them. It was a completely different human being. Mimicry. Two names which Justice Chandrachud forgot to mention. He used to mimic Justice Bhagwati beautifully. And the best mimicry he used to do is of Mr. Sirvai. And I remember when SP Gupta was being argued. And those are the days Supreme Court used to have SLPs every morning. And Soli had a bag full of SLPs every morning. So he used to go running in the morning for his SLPs. And Mr. Sirvai used to get very upset because he wanted him to come and sit from 10.30 in the court. <laughs> and the calls they used to have after with Soli for the next five minutes would regale us with his Sirvai stories. <laughs> and that ultimately sums up the person. He, on the one hand, was a genius in law. There's no question about it. The way he developed law, the way he used to, the way he used to see law, the way he visioned the constitution and constitutional principles, be it freedom of speech, be it secularism, be it, or, or his understanding of the basic structure, his understanding of fundamental freedoms, his understanding of uh, the federal structure. We worked against each other. We worked together. When he was attorney general, I was solicitor general. We did important cases involving federalism. And it was always a learning experience working with him. But there are a lot of, there are other lawyers I have had the privilege of working with who are great minds, but I don't think I have worked with such a wonderful, sparkling personality. Soli, I will miss you forever. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for such kind words. Now, may I request uh, Eskane, sir, to say a few words, please? Honorable, <clears throat> Honorable Chief Justice, Honorable Justice Lalit, Honorable Justice Chandrachu, members of the Sorabji family, and friends at the bar. Soli was not only my mentor, he was a philosopher and a guide who gave me deep and valuable insights, not just into law, but more importantly, into life, uh, uh, 
in general. One such valuable insight which I gained from him came just three days after I had joined his chamber uh, in Bombay. Soli had been briefed to appear before the division bench of the Bombay High Court in an important writ petition. We had a conference and the client appeared in the conference. He was a very timid and unimpressive person. He put forward a line of argument which was shot down in flames by his own solicitor. The next day, when the case was called out in court, I believe the bench was presided over by Justice Savant. Justice Savant rejected all our carefully formulated arguments. And then at the end, just before we thought the petition was about to be dismissed, he said, why haven't you raised this point? On this point, you should succeed. And that was the very point which the unimpressive client had suggested to us in conference and which had been shot down. Afterwards, when we were together, Soli told me, this is an object lesson. We should welcome light from any source to come in and illuminate our work. Light is the best disinfectant, he was very fond of saying, and the greatest dispeller of ignorance and misunderstanding. Soli firmly believed that a lawyer's stock in trade as well as his arsenal consisted of nothing but words. And if these words were properly marshaled and effectively presented, even an argument which was not intrinsically very strong would achieve a strength and a momentum and a life of its own. He was fond of saying that Winston Churchill had mobilized the English language and had sent it into battle in World War II. And it was because of that, that England had won that war. He emphasized very strongly the fact that effective packaging of a thought or idea has a direct impact on its content and its appeal, and, and its appeal to the court. He quoted Shakespeare, who never had a kind word for the legal profession, but he expressed his thought very well. And I quote, what plea in the law so tainted, but seasoned with a gracious voice, obscures the show of evil. In other words, even a tainted plea, but presented effectively and properly, has a life of its own, has a strength of its own, and it cannot be brushed aside by the court. Soli accordingly used to embellish and fortify his arguments with allusions from English literature, for which he had a deep and abiding passion. I can recall two sterling instances when his literary allusions literally turned the scales and helped our client to win. One was a writ petition, which we had filed against the excise authorities, seeking to compel them to disgorge a huge amount of refund, which they were sitting on. And solely compared the mindset of the collector of central excise with that of the famous English playwright Sheridan, who was incorrigibly indebted to his creditors and who told his creditors, as a matter of principle, I never pay interest and it is not in my interest to pay the principal. We got the, an order for refund within three months. There was another case where everything turned on whether we would get a hearing from the authorities concerned. So the court scoffed at our argument and said, Mr. Sorabji, we, we all know exactly what happened in this, in this case. And I think grant of a hearing would be a complete waste of time. So to which Soli said, Soli gave, uh, Soli's reply was, was based on an English judgment, which referred to even the all-knowing almighty granting a hearing to Adam and Eve before, before banishing them from the Garden of Eden. He also recalled the immortal words of Lord Megari in the case of John versus Rees. And I quote, the path of the law is strewn with open and shut cases, which ultimately proved not to be so open and shut at all, of unanswerable charges, which ultimately were completely answered, of inexplicable conduct, which ultimately was totally explained, and of fixed and unalterable decisions, which after discussion was substantially and materially altered. 
we got a we got a direction for a hearing and i think it was the literary allusions which really turned the scales in our favor but at the same time soli would also point out that when our client had been subjected to grave injustice it is better to dispense with these literary allusions to use his memorable words sometimes a strident scream is better than a doctoral dissertation his love for literature for which he had an enduring passion which continued throughout his life was mixed up with a slightly mischievous uh, a streak which i think a puckish sense of humor which i think i should place before you because only then you can grasp the man and understand him as a whole i once invited his attention to a book on english legal humor called esprit de law and it opened with the memorable words so you want to read something about barristers you can look them up in holsbury's laws of england you will find barristers there right between bankruptcy and bastard so this greatly excited soli and he ordered me to immediately go and get the concerned volume of holsbury and verify whether this assertion in esprit de law was correct i had to do it in the next half hour and i had to report to him that the quotation was absolutely correct he also was fond of quoting the humorist george burns who on his 92nd birthday was asked what is the birthday present that you would like to have on your 92nd birthday and george burns replied there is nothing that i would like more than to be served with a notice and a summons and he paused for effect in a paternity suit so he liked that very much and he would often quote that now i think i cannot do better than to end with another quotation which soli was extremely fond of and this was in a reply which justice felix frankfurter of the us supreme court sent to a young man who had written to him asking for advice on how best to prepare for the legal profession and justice felix frankfurter replied fill your mind with a deposit of much good reading and broaden and deepen your feelings by experiencing as much as you can the wonderful mysteries of the universe and forget all about your future career i firmly believe that in his youth soli sorab ji never needed that advice thank you very much thank you sir for such kind words uh, can i request mrs subramaniam to say a few words please honorable the chief justice honorable mr justice lalit honorable mr justice chandrachud my special mentor zina zia jahangir homers and distinguished members of the audience i thank the sorabji family offering this occasion to speak a few words about soli soli sorabji will be always recognized as the greatest indian lawyer since the second world war he occupies the hall of fame with cornelia sorabji and of course dr richard sorabji who narrated to me at oxford his constant kindness when he used to visit delhi a glorious career as an advocate over an unusually long span he was the first individual in the modern era to act both as counsel for citizens and act as attorney general twice in dispensations which still bore pluralism as a creed nevertheless his arguments defined the place of individual rights in the landscape of a changing indian constitution 
His knowledge of comparative law informed his interpretation of constitutional law, and he merged and layered this with knowledge of treaty and various international conventions. He was a mentor, a bow idol, a teacher, an empathic soul, who delighted in the successes of his juniors. I saw him for the first time in 1974. He came to argue the St. Xavier's College case. I was sitting there in the visitor's gallery looking at him. And I still remember that Zena too came to hear him argue that matter in the Supreme Court. He was very alert, quick, smart, moved with energy, and I harbored a secret desire to be like him. Years later, my mother, whom I miss till today, asked Soli, if he saw any merit in me, he would leave it to him to advise me. I walked inside the first floor in Sundanaga. I was overwhelmed by a large Doberman and solely intuitively assessed me. Very importantly, there was a certain understanding which he exuded and quickly asked me to join his chambers from the next day. In him, I found the qualities which lead to peace that passeth understanding in the words of Wordsworth. He would start the day with nature. He would alternate between poetry and music. He would treat the members of the staff as members of the family. Dislike of ostentation, a playful sense of humor, a great mimic without any disparagement, and a man who was untouched by jealousy. He had a unique style of working. His reading speed was enormous, accompanied by quirky annotations on the back flap. And that was sufficient to set out his questions in a conference where he quickly moved like a thoughtful judge in the head, a possible answer. And he had the design of argument already in his head. He never spoke once rudely, never once said an offensive word to a judge, and he maintained the most excellent standards of professionalism. He was indeed a great typification of Justice Frankfurter's advice. He enjoyed art, he admired painting, he loved classical Western music, Mahler's Second Symphony and resonated with humanity and the spiritual without an overt God like John Rutter, the great English composer. He argued with ease and elegance and it was a privilege to witness his torrential downpour of arguments which bore the stamp of conviction sometimes, and poetry, and many times with trigonometric precision. Even though we have our individual journey of life, what is life if we do not publicly admit our debts? I remember Chief Justice Y.V. Chandrachud telling me with his gentle and characteristic smile, Brilliance and perseverance are very relative terms. What comes with perseverance endures. In the profession, you never still, you go up or you go down. It is a slope. Very wise words, never forgotten. And when I mentioned this to Soli, Soli said, 
remember this always. Soli taught me so many things. Amongst them, the uselessness of praise, the ethic of decency, fairness in advocacy, connectedness with all. He lived out every part of the leaves of his extraordinary wife, Zina's book of values. Whatever I am is a product of Soli's care, love, and benediction accompanied by Zina's unwavering blessing. He rejected with characteristic firmness, clarity and authority, the then government's approach to the judiciary. Like Tom Bingham, he believed that the function of independent judges charged to interpret and apply the law is universally recognized as a cardinal feature of a modern democratic state, a cornerstone of the rule of law itself. Those judges who valued human liberty with concrete soulful acts of enforcement of fundamental rights and who were visited with punitive transfers were elevated to the Supreme Court with the exception of two judges. Soli knew the value of truth and justice. He hid his personal disappointments about individuals, would not easily disclose, but retain it as personal pain. That was the reason I knew, which restrained him from critical expression in recent times. But yes, he did feel the pain. That would be right to say. As Shakespeare said in Romeo and Juliet, death lies on him like an untimely frost. What do I feel now? In honor of a lawyer whose advocacy flowed like a full summer throated ease, I can only share Keats. Forlorn, the very word is like a bell to toil me back from thee to my soul self. Adieu, the fancy cannot cheat so well. And she's famed to do, deceiving elf. Adieu, adieu, thy plaintive anthem fades. Past the near meadows over the still stream. Up the hillside, and now it is buried deep. In the next valley glades, was it a vision or a waking dream? Fled is that music. Do I wake? Or sleep. Soli, like Auguste Comte, was a believer in humankind. His religion is and was humankind, and it has powerfully moved me in my life, along with Henry Sedgwick, that this alone will endure safely for times to come. Soli, I will miss your physical presence, but I will not forget you. In the strength of your memory, wistfully seeing your smile, I will be like you, quick to hide my tear. I share the sense of loss with Zina, Jamshed, Homer's, and Zia. But this legendary Allegro will always live on. He will always reinforce our dignity, the inner beauty and creativity with which every one of us is born. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I'll request Mr. Dattar to say a few words. Uh, Honorable Chief Justice of India, this is Ramana. Justice Lalit, Justice Chandrachur, 
members of the Sorabji family, it's indeed an honor and a privilege to be invited to say a few words on this extremely memorable occasion. Many speakers have extolled the virtues of Mr. Sorabji. I thought I'll just add the fact that he had an outstanding academic career and in the Government Law College of Bombay, he passed out winning the Kinlock Forbes gold medal in Roman law and jurisprudence. So apart from being an outstanding lawyer, he started off as a brilliant and outstanding student as well. For me, a lawyer from Madras, my first senior briefing in the Supreme Court was by a happy coincidence, Mr. Soli Sarabji. In 1982, I was just two years in the bar. And I still remember going to his house in Sundarnagar. And much has been said about his mimicry. For me, he was somebody very like a legend, some awe-inspiring person for a young lawyer from Chennai. And after our brief conference, Mr. Gulam Vanvati also was there. And I still remember Mr. Sorabji and Mr. Vanvati speaking something. And Mr. Sorabji mimicked Justice Madan very well and both had a hearty laugh. And it was so easy. I felt that the man was so great, but yet he was so simple and humble as well. Two years later, I had the opportunity of watching him closely for several weeks in the famous beef tallow matter. It was, I was the junior representing the Chennai importers, the Madras importers. And I was led by VP Raman, who was a well-known lawyer, but not famous in the national scene. And Mr. Sorabji was leading the arguments for all the importers. And it is there that I realized the importance of advocacy and the famous saying of Cicero, that if truth was self-evident, eloquence would be unnecessary. The manner in which he answered the questions, and mind you, it was a very strong bench of Justice Chinnaparadi, Justice Venkatramaya, and Justice A.P. Sen. And the thrust and parry between senior counsel and the judges was absolutely remarkable. And it was a great lesson to me in advocacy. Apart from Mr. Sorabji, we also, in that batch, we had Mr. Ashok Desai, Mr. Ram Jaitpalani. And it was a treat to see different kinds of advocacy going on. And I'm sure that whatever relief was, we got was substantially due to the persuasive advocacy of Mr. Sorabji. I never, in all the years that I knew him, never found him to raise his voice or enter into any kind of unpleasant altercation with a judge. It was, he was always uh, the role model in how to argue a case. Not many people know that many speakers have spoken about his contribution to constitutional law. But we should not forget that in the field of indirect taxes, I think he has perhaps made a very, very significant contribution in the development of the excise law immediately after the tribunal came in the 1980s and so on. So I used to always meet him sometimes in excise matters. And he was the person who introduced me to Mr. Tarapurwala when I was writing my excise book. Of course, I met him off and on and uh, got many, many chances to work with him as the other speakers have be involved with him. But the turn of event came after Mr. Palkiwala died and he invited me to be the co-author of his of the courtroom genius, which was being published by the Palkiwala Memorial Trust. And that was when I really got to know him well and at so many meetings at his house in Niti Bagh, he gave me letters of introduction to very many people who were contemporaries of Mr. Palkiwala. And because of him, I got the chance to meet very many legendary people like Justice Vaivi Chandrachur, the other colleagues of Mr. Palkiwala at that point of time. And what was important was he said that, look, when we are writing the book, let us also interview the people who briefed Mr. Sirwai and Mr. the other people in the rival side of Kesan Bharati. And that's how I got, got a chance to meet the other briefing council who were briefing Mr. Sirwai, Mr. Andhirujana was there, Mr. Hingurani and many other people. So writing this particular book, also the juniors of Nirande, writing Courtroom Genius really got me in touch with him. And as everybody mentioned, he had a tremendous sense of humor. And uh, so many anecdotes he told me about life at the Bombay bar, in the bar library in Bombay, how one particular lawyer had an altercation with uh, A.G. Nurani and actually physically lifted him and pushed him into, a, uh, into the glass <laughs> thing of the library and the whole glass shattered and the matter was taken to the Chief Justice. But the way he put the anecdotes was really, really tremendously humorous. As far as Mr. Sorabji is concerned, the uh, one important lesson which I learned from him also was the 
need or the, uh, the the necessity of having something beyond your work. We all keep talking of work-life balance. For most lawyers, it's just work, work, and no life at all. But he was a person who was able to manage not only a very busy practice, but as all other speakers have mentioned, his love for jazz, his love for music, his, his interest in reading, his work at the India International Center. And one thing which I have to highlight is his tremendous contribution of taking India to several international symposia and conferences. Indeed, in a certain sense, he, along with a few lawyers, was really the India's face in most international seminars and international fora. His contribution to our, the, uh, his contribution to these seminars was indeed remarkable. As people have mentioned, I think that for an architect, the legacy of an arch architect is the are the memorable buildings he leaves behind. And for a senior lawyer, perhaps one important legacy he leaves behind are the juniors he fosters and the, the next generation that he creates. And in that, I think Mr. Sorabji's contribution is extremely stellar. He, as we see, we have Justice Lalit, we have Harish Salve, we have Ganesh, we have Gopal Subramanian. And this is perhaps the biggest legacy of Mr. Sorabji, in my opinion, that he created a new generation of outstanding lawyers and kept the standards of the bar at a very high level. For that, we have to eternally be grateful for him. He was also extremely fortunate in his family. Apart from his own personal success as a student, as a lawyer, as a law officer, he also had the blessings of remarkable children who did extremely well in their respective fields and earned laurels for themselves. Few things can gladden a father than to see his children doing well in their respective professions. So in that sense, he was truly a blessed man. Finally, I just was thinking to myself that we have seen so many greats. I mean, I've always enjoyed reading the biographies of great lawyers. The previous generation had the Settlebar, the Daftari, the, the, the S.V. Guptas and so on. This generation, my generation, we have seen very eminent lawyers. We have Mr. Sorabji, Mr. Nariman, Mr. Ashok Desai, Mr. Anil Divan, all, Ram Jethpalani, all these people are there. And there's so much to learn from all of them. There's so much to learn from all of them. The way they prepared their cases, the way they argued their cases, the demeanor in court, the courtesy shown to the judges, the importance of not raising your voice, the importance of presenting your case in a proper manner. These are all the lessons that we learn from him and we'll eternally be grateful for him. At the end of the day, I think the senior counsel will do best if he lives his life in such a way that he is a role model for the younger generation. And in this, I think Mr. Sorabji filled his role to the hilt. We have the concept of a Hall of Fame in, England, in the US, where you have the Hall of Fame for basketball, Hall of Fame for various sports. I think in just four years, our Supreme Court will complete 75 years. And if ever we have a Hall of Fame for lawyers, I'm sure Mr. Sorabji's name will be right up at the top of the people in this Hall of Fame. It's been a privilege to speak at this seminar. There's so many memories of the man. And though it is inevitable, we will always remember him. We'll have the roses in December. And if we can live up to his values, his method of advocacy, then we would have paid the real tribute to him. My sincere uh, condolences to the family. And we can assure them that while he'll no, not be with us, Throughout the Supreme Court, the memory of Mr. Sorabji will always be, when you walk through the corridors and walk, enter the courtrooms, we'll always remember Mr. Sorabji. My homage. Thank, thank you, sir. Uh, can I request uh, Ms. Zia Modi to speak few words on behalf of the family? Thank you, Pallavi. Uh, thank you to the Honorable Chief Justice for making time to attend. There's also Justice Lalit and Justice Chandrachur. And thank you to all his uh, wonderful, loving juniors on the panel today, <laughs> loving mentees and his friends, and to all of you who have taken the time to listen in on a Sunday. Uh, I really have, since Papa's passing, got to know so much more about him through the letters we've received, through what his juniors have said. My interaction with my father was much more personal uh, than lawyer to lawyer, simply because of the way life traveled for us. Uh, when we were young, uh, it was fascinating to watch daddy at the dining table with that cordless telephone 
that was the most recent invention at that time, getting calls from his solicitors for matters the next day, barking out judgments that he wanted kept ready, getting irritated with the fact that something hadn't been addressed. And I used to just hear that one side of the conversation and always used to marvel at the way he could go from matter to matter, deep dive and come out and then the next phone call would come. Uh, when uh, he moved to Delhi and when the emergency was on, I had left to study uh, law abroad. And so I saw very little of daddy's uh, uh, climb to his uh, conviction of freedom of expression and freedom of the press. But as a father, he was quite indulgent. And so today, all of us have actually gathered in one of his favorite hill stations when we were all growing up called Mahableshwar. My mother and my three brothers are all here together. And it is one month today since his passing. So thank you for this important memorial for him. The, the uh, indulgent father was because I was the eldest and the only girl. So I always had a soft spot in his heart. He used to want to spoil me. And my mother used to try to you thwart every attempt on that score. When I was 18, I desperately wanted a car. My mother felt that was spoiling her daughter. So the compromise was I got a secondhand car, which was actually a taxi. It was terrible. It broke down very quickly. But my father at least could tick the box and say that he got his daughter a car. When I went to England, I was desperate for a car. My mother again put her foot down. So I got a Volkswagen secondhand for 60 pounds, which constantly broke down and cost me more to repair. But daddy would always try and get to deliver what I wanted. When it came to my brother Jahangir, who is a doctor today, we always tease him that he was my father's favorite. We used to call him Lord Fauntleroy. And he was very keen to be a lawyer. But my mother said, I have one lawyer, now you go become a doctor. So he became a doctor. And then came my brother Hormaz, who defied all Sorabji conventions. If we did not do academically in school, my brother Jahangir and I, my mother had that grim look on her face when our report card came. And grim means if we didn't come in the first top three. With my brother Hormaz, all these rules went to the wind. And if he didn't bother to do academically well, my, my father would say, but he's meant to be the wicket keeper of the Indian cricket team. Why are you irritating me and talking to me about this? So ultimately, my youngest brother also got to do what he loved doing. And so I think my father gave us the correct amount of indulgence and my mother gave us the love, but also the discipline. So when I went to New York and I was working there and I wanted to come back to India, I remember my father once came to my office at uh, Baker and McKenzie and said, you have your own cabin, you have your own secretary. Are you sure you'll be able to manage and come back to council practice? And I said, but Papa, how bad can council practice be? You're doing so well. Why can't I give it a shot? He said, you think about it. There's no room. There's no secretary. There won't even be a full desk. You just think about it and come. But I came. I came to get married to my husband, Jaydev, and I went into my father's chambers. He was in Delhi. My one regret is I never really got to do many, many matters with Delhi. Very few, few and far between. Really, it was working in Bombay with the juniors. But my father was always curious when I argued a matter myself. He always wanted to see me open my mouth. If I argued, and I remember the three judges he used to ask me about every time were Justice Chandurkar, Justice Pense, and Justice Rege. If I argued before them, he'd tell me now, what did you say? What was the proposition you put? And then when I said I put it like this, he would say, did the judge say this? And he would promptly give give me, because he knew all his Bombay judges, would promptly give me the reaction that they would have had to my arguments. So in his own way, he took an interest in my career, even from afar. And as Harish said, taught me to read a bench, always told me how to read a bench and reminded me many a time, don't fight with the judge. 
whatever you think of him, he's the one who's giving you the order and the judgment. Don't be condescending. Don't be supercilious. Remember, he's up there for a reason. Somebody thought he was a good judge and you are simply a lawyer. So all these things that we learned as, uh, as I saw, as I hear the Sorabji tribe talk uh, on this on many other occasions, I realize he did create a breed of good-minded, value-endorsing young men and women and may their tribe increase. May they all have many juniors that they bring up the same way. Papa was really a man for all seasons, apart from the jazz and the poetry and the many areas of the law that he did, his mimicry, as we've talked about. I think that in a way, after his passing, we really received so many loving messages from people all over the world, giving their few instances and memories of my father. For me, at least, it served like an anesthetic. And I'm sure it did to my mother as well as my brothers. We sort of, in Mableshwar, we've been here laughing about daddy, talking about the crazy instances when, you know, he was mimicking someone or in Mableshwar, he used to dress up like General Patton and uh, go around in his car and make all of us children play little parts in this, that and the other. He made me want to learn Ham. He, he insisted I learned large portions of Hamlet by heart. When I said, how about Portia? He said, no, Hamlet first, then we'll get to Portia. So uh, these are really the memories that we have of daddy, but always very middle class in his values. Uh, money was never a driver. He was slightly contemptuous of it in his own way. Uh, I think that I remember once when he came to my uh, office in uh, Express Stars in Nariman Point, I had asked him to come to give a lecture to all our lawyers on ethics, integrity, values, etc., which he did. As he was going out, I heard him tell my chauffeur, why did you bring the Mercedes car? Where is Zia's Maruti car? Don't bring the Mercedes car for me next time. And my poor husband thought he was, you know, doing my father a favor by putting him in a more comfortable car rather than my Maruti car. And the driver looked completely puzzled. My partners following daddy behind him looked completely puzzled. And I was just giggling away to myself, thinking I should have warned my husband to only send the Maruti. So I think what daddy left us with as a family is to be grounded, uh, to, to laugh at ourselves, uh, to understand the value of integrity, and to be honest to ourselves and to the world around us. I'm not sure that we succeed all the time, but I think what he asked us to do was to try. Uh, I think his last main interaction on a pretty slightly intense with, um, uh, level with me was when we, I was writing the book, which Chintan Chandratur is really 90% responsible for, called 10 Judgments That Changed India. And Chintan and I gave the final selection of the 10 judgments to my father, which he did. After the book came out, he phoned up very cross with me. Where's the Bomai judgment? I said, but you knocked that off. He said, I could never have knocked that off. Where's the Bomai judgment? You missed the Bomai judgment. So I had to show him that I had sent him an email that actually had deleted the Bomai judgment. And he said, no, no, I must have not been thinking that day. Put it in the next edition. The next edition is not coming out soon. So these are just some thoughts that I thought I would give uh, to share personally about my father. Uh, we are really so grateful to all of you. Uh, I think that it is the affection that he has left in the hearts of so many that will ensure that his memory lives on. And for us as a family, it is a deep, proud legacy. And I think that one that we are not going to give up easily. And we hope that we make him proud of us every day. Thank you so much. And thank you especially to Pallavi for taking all the trouble to put all this together. Thank I know you. it is not easy. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you who have tuned in. Thank you so much for joining us today, uh, all the honorable judges and panelists. Uh, we put an end and hope wherever Sir is, he's happily watching us and blessing us and hope he's as smiling as always. Thank you all. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.